Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. Today, UBC talks about cooperation for the better future of the Baltic Sea region. And I welcome you all uh, to our next one and a half hour session that we have. And um, yeah, let's start. Perhaps I just first introduce myself. My name is Esther Kreuzhassin and I work at the UBC Sustainable Cities Commission and I will host this meeting today together with my colleagues uh, Agnieszka Ilola and Maria Andreva. And I will introduce them and our speakers in a moment. Just a few words in case you have not been taking part um, in our webinars or you don't know our organization. So we work for the Union of the Baltic Cities, as I said, and they are for the Sustainable Cities Commission. The UBC is a network of cities in uh, the Baltic Sea region. We have been around for over 30 years and we have today around 70 member cities in all sizes from uh, all the countries around the Baltic Sea. And we are organized in eight thematic commissions focusing on different aspects of cooperation between the cities. And as I said, that we work for the Sustainable Cities Commission. And you will learn a lot more about how, yeah, how our organization operates in the region and what we really do in during this webinar. Our commission is located in Turku in Finland, um, and our main work is that we uh, do a lot of networking and exchange between our member cities, between different actors. We give input to regional policy development, do a lot of networking within the region, which is the topic of this webinar. And we have um, we are also planning, developing and implementing different kind of international projects with our cities. The basis of our work um, the, is the, our strategic program, the UBC Sustainability Action Program. And this is uh, like our, yeah, the basis, the framework of our work for our whole network to work with so, towards a sustainable Baltic Sea region. Just for you to uh, to 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 understand what what kind of topics we are dealing with, so we have th those topics um, identified for our current strategic program. These are the topics that we that we deal with, that we work with, that we we have our cities exchanging on, um, that we uh, organize projects on, etc. And all these have been developed in the cooperation with our cities to hear what are the needs of the cities and the challenges that they are facing. And you can see here that we deal with all kind of sustainability related issues. Um, that you can think of and try to support our member cities um, on the way to the to a sustainable transition. So you are now here in our webinar called UBC Talks. It's a webinar series that we have started a few years ago. Um, it's a nowadays I can say I think very established format. We have regular we have regular regularly these webinars. Um, if you uh, want to see uh, the topics that we have covered so far, you find all the recordings on our website and you're really welcome to follow us on social media also for the future to see all our upcoming webinars and I will we will uh, let you know uh, a bit more about upcoming events and, and so on later on. But uh, yeah, if you're interested to see, we have already covered a broad range of different topics um, and so that might be really interesting to, to check out this kind of library of of the UBC talk webinars. So now we come to today's uh, program. Um, we will start uh, with a little introduction on Baltic Sea region cooperation um, and also explaining like why we are actually organizing this webinar because there is a uh, yeah we saw a need of to organize this kind of webinar and then we will have a little bit different um, different format than usual. So we uh, want to really talk with the three of our main cooperation partners in this in this region. We will uh, talk and discuss with the Council of the Baltic Sea States. We will talk and discuss with the um, Baltic Sea Strategy Point for the EU Strategy of the Baltic Sea Region. And we will discuss with HELCOM. And I will introduce you soon to our speakers that we invited and we're really happy that they joined. After that, we will have a short uh, comment discussion and um, uh, and then we'll su sum this all up and hope to give you a good uh, impression of how all we all as actors here in the region work together. Um, just a few technical info that you can see here. So the webinar is recorded so that we can also make it available later on on our website. 
Um, all attendees are muted uh, by default, but you're really welcome to ask questions. Uh, you can use the Q&A box in, in the Zoom program. So we will then try to take them up um, where, where they fit and latest in the in the last discussion. Uh, we, will, we will take up your questions and so on. So please use that, that uh, opportunity. And as I said, we are three of us here today uh, hosting this. So I will start, but then my colleagues will take over and also have the discussion with our uh, speakers. And uh, before I show them more, I will present them a bit more later in more in detail. Just want to show you already. We're really happy to have three of them on board today. We will have Dominic Litfas from the Council of the Baltic Sea States, who is the acting senior advisor for regional identity and communications, who I will discuss with. Then we have Juhani Ailio from the Baltic Sea Strategy Point for the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region. He is the project manager and we are even sharing uh, the same location here in Turku. And Maria will have the discussion with him. And and then we have Lotta Ruokanen, who is the professional secretary at the Helcom Secretariat, who will join us a little bit later. And Agnieszka will have a short chat with her. So we will start with the short um, setting the scene of why we actually do this webinar. So we, were talk we talk about Baltic Sea Region Cooperation, and there are a lot of events on this. There are a lot of webinars. There are lots of uh, conferences on Baltic Sea Region Cooperation, and probably many of you have been taking part of this. Um, the reason why we want to talk about this is that because it's a big part of our work in the UBC Sustainable Cities Commission that we work with different actors in the region. And for us, this is our everyday work and we are very, uh, of course, used to this and used to, we know all the actors and so on. And we've realized that many of our member cities, and perhaps also you, if you're one of our member cities, perhaps don't always really understand of what are all these actors? Who are these? And especially when we use a lot of these abbreviations that you will see later that many of our the organizations in this region have long names and then we use the abbreviations that um, perhaps representatives from cities don't necessarily know like what is this organization? What are they doing? And actually how are they related to me or to us as cities? And this is the reason why we do this webinar and we wanted to give you the introduction like why we are why we are doing this and why we consider this a very strong cooperation between actors and then uh, as very uh, important. But first we go a little bit backwards and we have a short look into uh, into the history. So Baltic Sea region cooperation started long long time ago and you can say that it actually started with the establishing of the Hanseatic League in the in the 14th and 15th century where then already like around 70 trading towns around the Baltic Sea were cooperating mainly in trade after now we make a big jump but uh, after the world war uh, 2 the second world war the cold war split the region into two sections for over 45 years which of course set stop for many corporations and made uh, cooperating on different levels very difficult but already then even though it was still the region was still split split there was a first let's say crack in the at that time so-called Iron Curtain, like in 1974, the Helsinki Convention was signed by all Baltic Sea coastal countries, which was, which was quite a revolution and quite a um, historical event. So the Helsinki Convention was signed to uh, address the marine environmental protection of the Baltic Sea because the Baltic Sea was in a very bad or was and is, but was then especially in a very bad environmental state. And uh, it was recognized that only a common effort would make a change or could make a change. And um, so the Helsinki Convention is a very special uh, international uh, um, in international co convention because it was um, signed in this kind of still very difficult geopolitical times. Then Going fast further after the fall of the Iron Curtain, so after 1919, the region experienced quite a revitalization. There was a lot of um, activities, there was a lot of initiations of new organizations and of networks on all governmental level to bridge this, um, bridge all, like re reconnect the region, reconnect the countries, reconnect cities, reconnect um, the regions and, 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 and there was a lot of cooperation on different levels. 
And uh, this has been going on for always, almost 30 years. Many of our organizations just had their anniversaries, their 30 years anniversaries. And um, I think I can tell a uh, talk for everyone that uh, nobody in the last years would have thought that we would be in that geopolitical situation where we are now. So of course, um, since uh, last year, everything has changed again, and uh, the the situation with the with the war in Ukraine uh, poses posed and poses very severe challenges for Baltic Sea region cooperation, especially now that Russia had was like removed from from all the all the organizations, and of course this 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 causes a lot of yeah a lot of challenges. But also in all the discussions and all the events that have been taking part uh, place in the last year and discussions on this topic, you can really see that mm, the actors in the Baltic Sea region are very strongly standing together and they also see a lot of possibilities to continue the cooperation and to yeah, perhaps make it even stronger. This, don't worry, you, honey, I will just mention it very shortly. Uh, I, but I have to mention it here, of course, one of the turning points for the Baltic Sea region was, of course, also the, um, the, the adoption of the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region. It was also very special because it's the first macro regional strategy of the EU and it was adopted in 2009. And it works as the framework for all cooperation within the Baltic Sea region. And that's something that, of course, brought a big change to how we all work and, and who is involved and, and to have a better coordination. But we will hear a lot more about this later on. Now, just a few words still about um, how, because we are talking about sustainable development in the Baltic Sea region, how we make the region more sustainable in general. So I wanted to point out these um, a few things at least. As I mentioned, the Helsinki Convention, Convention already in 1974 was a very um, yeah, historical event. Um, today we have the Helcom Baltic Sea Action Plan that is now has been just recently updated. Another very sp special issue in this region concerning sustainable development um, happened in 1996, where initiated by the CBSS, by the Council of the Baltic Sea States, a regional Agenda 21 was established called Baltic 21. It's something that did not exist in the world anywhere else than in the Baltic Sea region. So this was very special and Baltic Sea region has always been a forerunner in this. Um, then in 2016, of course, uh, Baltic 21 was changed, changed into the Baltic 2030, which is uh, as the Baltic 2030 action plan serving as a strategic document for the Council of the Baltic Sea States. And talking about our own history, so UBC, our commission, which used to be called Commission on Environment, was established in 1996, and we had the first local agenda 21 action program uh, um, uh, adopted just in 1999. And we are still, of course, uh, working with the same topics, but of course, in, in, a, in an updated version. And we have our action, action program from 22 to 2030. That is the basis of our work, as I mentioned before. This is something for you, I hope that it kind of sets a little bit the context of the discussions that we will have. And here we try to, and I said it's some actors because I'm definitely not claiming that we have them all here, uh, but this is, let's say, the main actors in the region that we are working with and trying to show you a little bit like where how this all works together. So we have the different levels of governance or different, different levels of activities where different organizations are located. We have the international level with Helicom, we have the national or intergovernmental level with the Council of the Baltic Sea States. Then we have a lot of actors that work on the regional level, on the macro regional level in the Baltic Sea region. And then we have those actors that they're in between. So we are of course, a macro regional actor. So we work in the Baltic Sea region, but we are representing the local level working with cities. We have uh, different kind of, we have NGOs, we have networks, we have um, uh, different kind of uh, associations. We have like a think tank like Centrum Balticum, for example. And of course, we have also here in this region, which is I think quite special, we also have different actors or like different um, funding programs slash actors that are of course very um that are the like giving support in that sense financial support for the transition of this region so now we will um get to know a few more of the actors but just to kind of wrap this up so where we are in this in this system so 
Uh, UBC has been also, of course, changing a lot over the last 30 years. We have all kinds of sizes of cities. Um, and as I mentioned before, so we are promoting sustainable transition on the ground, so to say, with the Baltic Sea region cities, with our member cities. So we want to bring the local perspective of the cities to the other levels of discussions, to the other actors, uh, other organizations. And we want to bring the, let's say, bigger topics and more framing topics from other levels back to the cities. And how can we do this? This is what we want to discuss now. And um, now I'm really happy to I will end this here. <laughs> and I'm really happy to now welcome uh, Dominic Litfas as my uh, partner of discussion, uh, who works for the Council of the Baltic Sea States and will give us a short intro and then we will discuss with him how we can cooperate perhaps better. Many thanks, Esther, and uh, good morning to all. And I think you have already presented a lot. You've already given a lot of information about the CBSS, which will make my presentation uh, so much easier. Because <clears throat> when looking at yours, I realized that I may have forgotten a number of details, but you caught them all. And that will make it so much easier for me. Before I start presenting, I would like to bring your attention to our logo, actually. So if you look at the top right corner, you will see this round, this round thing, and then there are some waves in the middle. Uh, probably looks like like the Baltic Sea, slightly eutrophied. For those who know what eutrophication is, but if you look a little bit closer, uh, these are not these are not waves. They are actually this is a knot. This is a fisherman's knot, uh, which ties together you know two different pieces of of of, um, of a fishing line. Yeah. So when when a fisherman breaks his line, then he uses this fisherman's knot. And the history behind this logo here is that this gentleman that you see in hiding behind at the right, this is a Uffe Eleman Jensen. He is the former, or he was the former Danish Minister of Foreign Affairs. And he was passionate about fly fishing. That was his hobby. So when he came up with his other friend, um, and that's his other passion, his other passion is uh, geopolitics, and especially in the Baltic Sea region, so he and um, the German, his German counterpart, uh, Hans Dietrich Genscher, from the German, so the former German Minister of Foreign Affairs, after the wake, when after, in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, as Esther already explained uh, a lot in detail, so there was a little bit of a, there was a little bit of a vacuum in a political vacuum in the Baltic Sea region, and when the blocks, when when the Eastern Bloc um, collapsed. There was a risk that the countries from 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 this part would be ending up in some sort of a yeah like kind of a political vacuum and to ensure that you know democratic processes would uh, prevail and that you know these countries wouldn't uh, struggle struggle too much these two gentlemen decided to set up some sort of a cooperation format to ensure that these countries would have time to adapt to the new geopolitical uh, realities and this is 1992, and this is what led to the creation of the Council of the Baltic Sea States. And the foreign ministers, so driven by these two, the other foreign ministers uh, also decided that this would be a very good idea, and set up the Council of the, CB, the Council of the Baltic Sea States in 1992. And here is a quote uh, by uh, Hans Dietrich Genscher, together with Uffe Edelman Jensen, so not in 1992, a bit, a little bit later. But where they, when asked about the reason behind the creation of the CBSS, they said that in light of political changes in Europe, the dream was to create a forum which could serve as a driving force behind political and economic stabilization and cooperation in the new Baltic Sea region. Yeah. So, of course, uh, today the situation is also a little bit different because you know, Esther already mentioned that you know, Russia has left uh, most uh, cooperation formats and the CBSS is no, ex no, no exception. I'll get back to it uh, later. So <clears throat> today, the CBSS is uh, comprised of um, 11 members and more or less the same countries uh, than where UBC operates, except that we also have Iceland as part of uh, one of our uh, member states. And the reason here is that Iceland is uh, one of the Nordic 
you know, is one of the Nordic countries and it's part of the wider Baltic Sea region, uh, macro region. So it, it, it makes sense to have Iceland on board as well. We were established in 1992 by a ministerial declaration. So unlike, for instance, Helcom, which is based on a treaty, uh, it is basically just the decision by the ministers to engage in cooperation. And based on this ministerial declaration, it, things got formalized a little bit. And that also led to the establishment of a headquarter uh, in Stockholm, where our secretariat is located and where I am working. But our structure is relatively flexible, and that allows us to, for instance, you know, respond to geopolitical changes like we're seeing right now. It was very easy for us to one, um, to one first uh, to suspend Russia in the wake of uh, its, its uh, invasion of Ukraine, but also to quickly adapt when Russia then left uh, the council. So it didn't led to the collapse of the organization and this this flexibility allowed us to basically function in a relatively um, good 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 way so we have the status of an intergovernmental organization and yes as i said our headquarters are in uh, in stockholm and our terms of reference which are somehow a little bit so or this part here is a little bit uh, our 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 motto our um our our vision and objective so the CBSS encompasses all multilateral intergovernmental regional cooperation in areas agreed by its members and serves as a forum for political dialogue. It also fosters practical cooperation in the region and acts as a focal point of information and coordination. So this, this platform for political dialogue is really what is underpinning uh, our, our activities. And then we also have the practical cooperation aspect, this people-to-people in this kind of more you know, hands-on approach of you know solving uh, macro regional problems at the macro regional at the macro regional level so this is what we are trying to do our structure is um although it's 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 based on on a on a on a declaration only it's it's actually quite quite heavy on top we have the council uh, which is a body consisting of the foreign ministers plus a, a high-level EU representative. And usually the council meets uh, once a year in ministerial sessions. Um, in 2014, the ministerial session stopped, stopped because of the invasion of, uh, of Crimea by, by Russia. So then, although cooperation continued in the CBSS, at the higher level, it was already a bit you know, difficult to have uh, formal, formal meetings. So that is 2014 already. And this changed uh, with the withdrawal, and we had our first ministerial session, official ministerial session in uh, 2022, uh, just after uh, you, just after Russia pulled out of uh, the CBSS. But when the ministers don't meet, so between between the sessions, we have our committee of senior officials, which is the intersessional decision-making body, and consists of appointed senior. Uh, foreign affairs officials and these guys these people guide the day-to-day -day work uh, of the cbss and under these under the cso we have uh, cbss bodies uh, where we have our experts seated uh, either from foreign affairs but also in the line ministries and there we have a number of different formats uh, one the first are the expert groups and here we have for instance uh, an expert group on sustainable development but we also have an expert group on sustainable maritime economy then we have units and task forces that respond to a specific problem and here the ones that are currently quite strong are our children at risk unit and the task force on trafficking in human beings and then we also have a number of networks such as for instance uh, the civil protection network and all of this is coordinated by the CBSS Secretariat, which facilitates uh, the work of the CBSS and puts into practice the decision taking by our political masters, so the Council and the Committee of Senior Officials. Yeah. So the priorities have changed a lot over time. In 1992, one of the priorities uh, was to promote uh, democracy and you know, democratic processes uh, in the Baltic Sea region. But also, you know, to help um, the non-EU member states, you have to remember that in 1992 only Denmark and Germany were part of the EU, and the others were, um, you know, they were actually in the process of accession to the EU. And the CBSS 
one of the tasks of the CBSS was to facilitate and you know help these countries to access the, the European Union. But today we have uh, three main long-term priorities. One is regional identity, under which you will find culture, higher education, and use. And here the focus is on laying the foundations for a more resilient region by establishing a deeper understanding for each other. So we believe that the more we talk, the more we understand each other, we will be in a better position to sort out you know, the other issues, such as, for instance, those related to sustainable development and so forth. And then we have another. So our second long-term priority is a safe and secure region. And under there, we have the anti-trafficking in human beings, child protection, and civil security. And our third um, long-term priority is sustainable and prosperous region, under which you will find climate dialogue, science cooperation, sustainable development, and sustainable maritime economy. And here, the focus uh, is a lot on the you know, UN Agenda 2030 and the sustainable development goals, especially on localizing the global agenda. And I think this is something that will be of relevance uh, in our talks uh, with, with Esther in a few, in a few minutes. Yeah. And um, but before I stop, um, well, first, I want to wish you um, a happy Easter. But uh, this is not the purpose. Uh, this is not the purpose of this slide. We hear a lot about multi-level governance and, uh, and and Balticness. These are kind of the buzzwords that are, you know, when you mention uh, when CBSS is mentioned, this always you know pops up in in one way or another. So um, what it's a bit difficult to 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 pinpoint. So I like to, to liken Balticness uh, to a bird's nest because there is no such thing as, you know, there's no Baltic uh, culture as such. There are lots of different cultures. There is a Nordic culture, there is a you know, Germanic culture, uh, different languages, uh, different religions, uh, even different you know, food preferences. But when all of these bits are put together, they form they form a whole. They form. Uh, they form like this. You know, like twigs are forming, forming a bird's nest. I think this. This is what what Balticness is all about. It's not one big concept, but it's several little bits and pieces that, when put together, form something really strong. And this is relative. This is very unique to the Baltic Sea region. Yeah. Like for example, you have if you look at language, for instance, if you take Finland, for instance, Finland has links to Sweden and uh, and to Estonia. Uh, Estonia then through its history and you know, in, in, in the Soviet in the Soviet Union and you know breaking from it and independence uh, will very much relate to the other Baltic states and so forth. So it's different bits and pieces that are somehow put together in this in this uh, concept of Balticness. And the sea, of course, the sea and the Baltic Sea uh, connects us, but then Balticness is what is what unites us. And it's very much the same uh, for multi-level governance. That's another thing that that uh, we often that we get asked a lot these days, and especially now as Russia has pulled out of the council, but other formats. Uh, so you know, what is the raison d'être of the CBSS, and why are you are you duplicating with you know with, with other uh, frameworks such as, for instance, the EUSPSR or, or or even Helcom, to mention but a few. But but again, it's the same thing here. It's it's you know we need this overlaps. We need this duplication. We need redundancy if we want a strong, you know, if you want a strong macro regional um, you know policy policy framework. And again, it's just like the nest. If you take one twig, one twig is basically meaningless. But it's only in combination with other twigs that 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 it actually works. Yeah. So so this is the purpose of uh, this slide. And I will leave it at that. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, Esther, back to you. Yes. Oh, well, back to us. I mean, we will continue in a little bit. Thank you very much. And I really, really like that allegory with the nest, because I think this whole concept of like regional identity and Balticness and what it means. And also in our case, when we discuss with cities, like what would it mean like for a city? It's it's hard to grasp sometimes, because as you said, there's on one hand many differences, but on the other hand, um, yeah, very, very much uniting, even though I would say that food preferences might be very uniting because I <laughs> we figured out that this might be very common in this region. But that's another topic. Um, 
What I would like to uh, ask you now still, so still UB CBSS is an intergovernmental organization. I mean, you have all the people working in the ministries in your CSO and you have, let's say it's on that level the discussion works. But at the same time, you say that, for example, yeah, you work with localizing SDGs. You also uh, have different formats where you want to, where you kind of want to address like the people, so to say citizens in this region. What could, uh, what does a city network like UBC, what can a city network bring to the work that you are doing? And what would you like us to kind of take up from the work that you're doing and bring towards our cities? Like how we are doing this already, um, but perhaps you have some ideas or some examples on how that can be improved. Yes. Well, I mean, for starters, uh, UBC is one of the bigger twigs <laughs> in, in the nest. And it's uh, it's it's a major part of this you know multi multi level governance or architecture in in the Baltic Sea region, of which the CBSS is also a major part. But you know by the, by you know the same token as as um, for instance uh, the EUSBs are or or Helcom. So, so we are major players. We we do touch on similar topics, but we have a slightly different approach, and we also have different stakeholders. We have different members we have different actors so these are the you know the little differences between our our structures is what actually makes cooperation really useful and strong and where we can have you know synergy effects so we are not duplicating so take for instance implementation of agenda 2030 um the S implementation of the sdgs we have a mandate, and you've already mentioned this. Um, we've, you've already mentioned the action plan, so the Baltic 2030 action plan, which is basically the roadmap for implementing the SDGs in the Baltic Sea region, or, or part of it. But when it comes to the, the actual implementation on the ground, um, the CBSS reach is uh, relatively limited because we are well, we are a foreign affairs body, and we are at the national level, but. Many of the SDGs will need to be implemented at the local level, and then this mm. is where the UBC then comes in. Mm. Yeah. So your network of uh, because you you also said it earlier that you know you have you are actually a macro regional organization, but but you know you work at the local level, mm. and, and this is what the CBSS doesn't have. On the other hand, the CBSS we have a link to the you know the political decision making. We have a link to the foreign ministers. And we do also have a link to, to the prime ministers because we can organize uh, Baltic Sea state summits, which are then attended by, by the prime ministers of the Baltic Sea region countries. And this is where we're getting uh, our, our long-term mandates from. So mm -hmm. this interaction between our two organizations, uh, I think this is very useful and is actually very much needed. And um, you are basically continuing where we stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And thanks for that explanation. I think that I hope this makes also now for our audience, I hope this makes things clear because I think, yeah, we, it's really, it's this kind of a, um, uh, like complementing each other and like, yeah, taking over when at, at some point, some, uh, let's say, uh, area, so to say, so to say stops. And yeah, just want to mention um, just also for, for, for everybody to know. So of course, so UBC is, um, we are, re we are part of the expert group on sustainable development, which is on like, let's say a little bit uh, higher level where we follow where we where we where we participate to see what is discussed on that but um perhaps i just want to get um still to some very concrete uh, examples i mean we have been doing projects together we are currently uh, working on new ideas and developing something together but perhaps you could say a couple of words for example on something very concrete like the just recently uh, finalized climate lock project on and, and the the hand, handbook so something that comes from cbss that is very practical for cities yeah so yeah you mentioned the uh, climate lock so this is a project that uh, was uh, launched to to promote uh, or to advance on you know climate action uh, at at the local and especially your know, municipal level hmm. and uh, so we have the mandates we have the SDGs, we have we have the the, um, the 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 action plan we have this you know the baltic 2030 uh, action plan but you know the concrete implementation on the ground this is where where uh, we had some well some 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 gaps and this is where the climate lock project comes in to help your know, municipalities 
um, you know, fulfill not their obligations, but help, you know, drive the implementation of, uh, of the SDGs and especially those uh, related to, to climate. So there, together with UBC, but also with the BCCC, so the Baltic Sea State Sub-Regional Cooperation, another acronym, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, under, I think it's, it's funded by the Swedish Institute, uh, we have um, launched this, this climate lock, and one of the outcomes of one of the outputs of the project was a handbook for municipalities to develop, uh, you know, climate climate plans. And I think this is this is a, a very good example of how this cooperation can work. We have some, you know, global mandates. We have some macro regional strategy, and then we have a local implementation on the ground. And for this, we we basically need we need a UBC on board, mm -hmm. and it's and especially its network. I think Climalock is a Climalock is a very good example of how this cooperation actually works in practice. And I think it worked very well. And mm -hmm. uh, as you've already mentioned, Esther, there are some more projects in the pipeline, uh, which we cannot really talk uh, more about now, but they follow more or less the same pattern. Um, you know, macro regional strategies uh, meets uh, local implementation at the local and the municipal level. So I think there will be more of these to come. Uh, and this is a format that has proven uh, proven to work very well. And Klimalock is actually one, one, one very good example. And then I can also mention um, another project uh, where we work with municipalities, which is uh, BSR Cultural Pearls, where we'll have the kickoff uh, meeting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And this is about increasing social resilience by tapping into the potential of culture and local assets. Uh, of uh, of municipalities. Um, so this is something that has just started and I'm pretty sure that uh, you will hear more about this. And mm -hmm. um, although UBC is not a partner, we do work with uh, municipalities in uh, Latvia, in Denmark, or even regions uh, in Lithuania and, uh, and, and Finland. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are some concrete examples. Um, and of course, uh, more to come in the future. Yeah. Great, thanks. And of course, we are also spreading information to member cities from you, for example, if there is something that you want to reach out to to a bigger group of cities and so on. So uh, all of our member cities will will hear about this. And we're really happy to continue this cooperation on climate uh, adaptation and climate uh, climate change in general in the future. Thank you, Dominic, very much. Uh, unfortunately, the time is already over. Probably we could have spent also the whole, whole webinar discussing. Um, but we will now uh, move on. Before, I just want to say if anybody has questions to Dominic or in general about what has been said so far, please add your questions to the Q&A box and we'll take them up later. But I would now uh, then we will now move on to our next speaker and to my next colleague. <laughs> um, but I will now give the floor to uh, Juhani Ailio from the Baltic Sea Strategy Point to give his short introduction to this or the organization. Thank you, Dominic. And then I will hand over to Juhani and Marina. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, uh, first of all, for the invitation and thank you for organizing this uh, this webinar. I, I uh, This is indeed very useful to us and I hope what I'm about to talk about the EUSBSR will be interesting and, and of use to, to the, uh, to the uh, cities and participants in the webinar. And now I will shortly share my screen. I would also like to uh, express my thanks to Esther and to Dominic on the historical overview of issues. So I, I can skip that part. So no no uh, overlaps on on this side, or I have at least not too much too much on this. But I, what I will say about the uh, history of European Union strategy uh, for the Baltic Sea, for the sake of my short uh, pitch here, is that it was. Founded in 2009 by the European Union, uh, in, by the initi initiative of the European Union Parliament, just for the reason to make, uh, to, to save the sea, to increase prosperity and connect the region, but also to make the most of the already uh, already quite uh, <clears throat> uh, quite large governance framework, governance network in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, the, the CBSS, the BCCC, UBC, and Helcom, all of these uh, actors already in the region doing a lot of good work, 
but uh, the uh, the ambition of the EUSPSR was to even more help to pull these organizations and their great work together and also include uh, various other levels, uh, uh, nation, more national level engagement, more regional, more uh, more local, and and also engage the civil society, and uh, hopefully also the business sector. And the uh, principle of multi-level governance was at the heart of the whole process of creating the European Union strategy for the Baltic Sea region. But uh, what uh, what the perhaps one very uh, important difference here is to say that the EUSBSR is very deeply embedded into the EU governance framework. It is uh, 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 directed, coordinated, so to say, from uh, from DG Regio. It is part of, uh, of the council process in the EU. For example, right now, the European Union Council is, is uh, considering uh, <clears throat> the, the council conclusions on the future of the macro region strategies and so. But let me go a bit forward in my presentation. Uh, here, there is a picture of the three main objectives that I already, already mentioned of the USPSR. These are set in the Commission communication on the uh, European Union strategy for the Baltic Sea region from 2009. And those have stayed, uh, stayed uh, with us from, from 2009. And those uh, uh, main objectives are implemented through 14 policy areas. These have changed uh, with the uh, revisions of the action plan that Esther already uh, uh, referred to a few times. The current composition is as you see here. And the policy areas, uh, they have a few actions within each of them that they implement for the uh, in, con in, uh, in cooperation with the other policy areas. So we have policy areas such as ship working on, on the marit uh, uh, efficiency of the ma maritime sector, also the sustainability and, 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 and effectiveness of, of the area. We have policy area culture uh, working on, on regional identity issues uh, and, 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 and cultural sites and, and their sustainability and usability. We have policy area education trying to uh, uh, increase the coherence and coordination and cohesion of the education policies and vice versa and, and a lot of more a lot more the uh, strategy is quite all-encompassing and that's by design it is uh, really as I said in the beginning it is an effort to bring all these different uh, levels of uh, cooperation in the Baltic Sea region together to make most of it so uh, actually, uh, the uh, CBSS, for example, as referred to by uh, Dominic already, is quite quite well integrated. Also, in the implementation of the USBSR, they are, are coordinating our policy area secure with great success, and also uh, through the regional identity work, they do mostly uh, cooperating also on the area of culture and in many other aspects. And of course, Helcom a great, a big and important player in the Baltic Sea region cooperation is coordinating uh, with VASAP, the policy area spatial planning, and also highly relevant in, in the uh, work of policy area nutria and, uh, and hazards and bioeconomy. And uh, all of this, all of this uh, ambitious effort, how it's governed, how it's uh, set up is uh, it's a bit complicated, but necessary for the whole, whole uh, big ambition of making the most of Baltic Sea region cooperation. And I'll try to quickly explain how it is done. Uh, so the main activities that are done uh, and implemented by the European Union strategy for the Baltic Sea region are done within the policy areas, the 14 policy areas in the previous picture. And the policy areas are uh, built uh, from a policy area coordinator from the uh, bottom middle in, in the picture, and uh, they are mostly uh, ministries, national line ministries, they are international organizations, they are regional actors, and uh, many different types of organizations there, but each policy area is supported by a steering group which is uh, combined uh, first and foremost of the relevant line ministries, but also of regional and uh, local actors are welcome to join, join these uh, steering groups. And the steering group is there to strategically guide 
the policy area coordinator while the policy area coordinator is the implementing actor. So this way we make sure uh, or try to make sure or that uh, the uh, activities of the policy areas are uh, uniformly accepted by all the member states and that we can also feed into the regional and local level or input into the activities. And uh, <clears throat> then we have uh, the European Commission which uh, participates in the work of all the policy areas, coordinates the overall thematic work there and supports them, supports the policy areas in uh, in uh, funding dialogues and, and so on. And the European Commission is everywhere. They they are really the glue here, uh, keeping, keeping this together. But the main decisions, like governance-related decisions, they are done by the National Coordinators Group, which is the... Uh, uh, which is uh, 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 constituted uh, from the representatives of uh, ministries of foreign affairs. Uh, they are the core decision-making body in, in the USBSR, not unlike the uh, CBSS CSO, uh, constituted a little differently, but it's a, it's a governing body. And uh, they uh, mostly guide the work of us as the Baltic Sea Strategy Point, who are... Uh, for, for the lack of the better word, a secretariat for the whole strategy. So the important players in the strategy are really the policy areas, policy area coordinators, their steering groups, and then the governance framework is, is uh, secured by the national coordinators group and, and uh, supported by us, the Baltic Sea Strategy Point. And how, as I said already, highly uh, embed, this EUSPSR is highly embedded in the EU EU processes. We have as our highest of high uh, strategic and political guidance the high level group, which is basically a, uh, uh, basically comes down to the European uh, European Council that is currently, as I said already, uh, 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 pondering on the uh, council conclusions on the future of the uh, macro region strategies, where they uh, reflect on the uh, uh, implementation report uh, of the USPSR and all the other three macro region strategies as well, that it was compiled by the European Commission. And uh, we will have the results actually now in, in June, and then we will, we will have uh, yet another uh, another uh, revision, uh, not a revision, but uh, uh, we will uh, then have much more strategic guidance again to to uh, re uh, redirect our our work. Um, but uh, I could talk more about ourselves and the uh, Baltic Sea strategy point, but I could also stop here and ask Maria to join me here. Thank you very much for the invitation, Johanny, and thank you for the great pitch. Um, the Baltic region is uh, often called the uh, the most governed or the most heavily regulated region, and we see exactly from your presentation how complex it is. Uh, so it was very helpful to see it visualized. Um, maybe I'll comment here for our participants uh, from our network side where where we are in this comprehensive structure, where what is the role of the UBC. So we cooperate, of course, on many levels and the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region for us is the guiding strategy for all activities and actions. We have had uh, over all of these years, we have had several strategic uh, flagship projects. Uh, we naturally cooperate with different policy areas, um, for example, be nutri or hazards, secure or spatial planning. So in different spheres that address sustainability. And uh, you know, the Baltic Cities has uh, steadily also for many years supported the organization of the annual forums of the strategy, both from the organizational side, and from the uh, input that we bring uh, on the urgent sustainability topics, on the tested solutions that we find in the cities, bringing that to the regional attention. Um, so outside of this, uh, for the better knowledge of, of our participants, if we turn now um, back to the comprehensive structure uh, of the EUSBSR uh, interconnections, uh, you have uh, you have showed us these connections. What is the role of cities in this structure? Where do these cities uh, come in, and uh, what support uh, do you offer for them, be it USBSR or Baltic Sea Strategy Point? 
Thank you, Maria. That's a, that's a really important aspect uh, of, of the uh, EU SPSR, the, the role, role of cities. Well, overall, the cities are, of course, one of them, one of or even maybe, let's say, the main implementer of many policies that really affect citizens and affect the development of the region. So they are indeed very important, and we, we would really like to see more involvement uh, of the cities and of UBC also in the USBSR. The policy areas are this place to be, and they, have, they are actually also constantly revising better structural ways of involving also the regional and local level to their work. Uh, one of these structural ways of participating in the work is, of course, also, also this that you already mentioned, these flagship proce projects and, uh, and so on, but also the steering groups would be a very good place for the UBC and to some extent also directly cities to be involved, to, be, to really feed into the strategic discussion in the policy areas. And this is uh, entirely possible, and some uh, policy areas are already implementing this, and I would I would highly, highly recommend that you are active towards the USBSR policy areas. Another operational uh, structural way of how the policy areas are, are trying to include the, the cities better into the governance framework are, uh, are uh, maybe these uh, less structural, uh, less strict uh, operational meetings that they are, uh, uh, they are working with and also just direct communication. But what is, of course, a problem here oftentimes uh, is that national level is easy, easier to get. It's um, uh, already included in the governance structure. We have less actors to involve in. When we go to regional and local level, we try. We need to figure out a way to engage, engage a much bigger group of, of organizations. And here, UBC, CPMR, BCCC, all these organizations organizations coming and it would be really good to and really great to see even more involvement of these UBC and, uh, and the other, other two organizations as well in the governance framework. Right, thank you. That's uh, very encouraging. Are there any support measures for it? For it? Maybe some funding opportunities or something that is there? Yes, of course there are. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, there is us. The Baltic Sea Strategy Point. If it's it's maybe important to hear mention mention some things about us. So the Baltic Sea Strategy Point was established uh, just uh, last October. Uh, we it is uh, set up by Central Baltic Foundation in Turku and the City of Hamburg, and we are as, as said already a kind of a secretariat to the uh, support unit to the USBSR, and we are perhaps the first door to go to come and knock or just maybe call me. My, my phone number is on, is on the website, usbsr.eu, and email as well. We are, the, uh, from the perspective of the city, is the first contact point. If you are looking to get more involved in the USBSR and activities, please come to us. We can offer you, uh, uh, we, can, we can help you in mapping out which policy areas are actually relevant to you, where you want to make an input, where you want to want to want to be involved, and where you are you are most also needed because you are needed. That's 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 a fact. We can't make the Baltic Sea region uh, better without without the cities and and so on. And when it comes to when it comes to funding, uh, the EU SBSR is constantly gradually becoming more and more relevant in defining actually what is funded in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, the, uh, the, the indirect programs and uh, are, of course, uh, the indirect Baltic Sea region program is doing great work in supporting the uh, Baltic Sea strategy and also the other, other transnational programs in the region are very important. And they are to report on this support to the Commission and so on, but so are actually also the national national EU funds, ERDFs and uh, ESF and so on. They are, they are to support the implementation of the macro regional strategies in their countries. And this is something that the Commission is supporting very much and is also monitoring on. So this is something that will in the future be, uh, uh, be, uh, be strengthened. And we are actually also working on structural ways of making that happen and be utilized. So important things coming up on the funding side as well. Exciting. Uh, thank you very much. This it actually sounds like a very nice step-by-step -step guidance for our cities to know exactly where to knock and uh, what to ask for you or your colleagues in the uh, in the strategy point. Uh, if 
we touch upon another very relatable probably thing for our uh, actors in the region, the annual forum. Uh, we know that the next USBSR annual forum takes place on the 4th to 5th October in our member city, Riga. And UBC is actually one of the co-organizers this year. Uh, using the chance, I would like to extend the invitation for everybody to join it. Uh, but uh, since we have you, honey, here, uh, could you maybe shed a little bit of light uh, on uh, what is the focus, what is in the focus there? What is the theme? And uh, maybe you could even give some hints about the next forums. Yes, thanks, Maria. That's that is right. So the next forum, the official theme uh, is safe and sustainable Baltic Sea region for future generations. So and uh, the focus is, of course, then on climate issues, green energy and youth. Those are the main main thematic themes of, of the forum. And uh, the aim within these, uh, these themes is that uh, that the forum is to um, be a platform for exchanging on best practices on, on this, uh, these topics and our best practice of cooperation. It is to facilitate a stronger, stronger integration within the Baltic Sea region and beyond, form synergies between various policy areas, and uh, then create links between the strategy and general public. And uh, the uh, forum is organized on the uh, 4th and 5th of October. There is already more information on the eusbsr.eu website. Please go there. Registrations will op open later this year. More information about the program is coming there constantly. And uh, it is also a place where uh, beyond the uh, main program, there is a possibility to organize, organize, uh, organize workshops. And, uh, the, and uh, the policy areas are here also a key, and policy area coordinators are a key player here. So uh, also one, one major uh, reason to be in touch with the policy areas and policy area coordinators is that you can get more visibility for your activities and more for your organizations also in the annual forum through them. And uh, if about the future forums, uh, there was a, a slight governance change in the USPSR annual forums just recently. Uh, the forums will, from 25 onwards, be organized in uh, in connection to the uh, the USPSR presidencies, the National Coordinates Group presidencies and Steering Group presidencies. This year uh, it is Latvia. Next year it's going to be Sweden. But from after Sweden, it goes to Poland, and will start to follow the presidency rotation. It's all, this information is already on 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 the website for those interested to dig it up. And of course, this is something very uh, useful information for for many cities, as you are uh, the cities are the uh, main organizers of the forum in the future as well. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I hope we all get to meet in uh, in Riga also this year and in the next forums to come because it's and continue the discussions because it's really interesting to dig into this uh, using Dominic's metaphor, the nest of interconnections. Um, thank you so much, Yuhani. It was really interesting to 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 get a chance to talk about this. Um, we have to finish here, uh, but we of course continue the cooperation in the region. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, now let's go to the other side of the large overarching regional cooperation on sustainable development, which is Helcom. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Lotta Rokonen joining us today, the professional secretary. And uh, uh, Lotta, I give you the floor to uh, give your pitch. And then uh, our deputy head of secretary, Agnieszka Jolola, will also join taking the stage uh, in the discussion. Thank you very much. I tried to share my screen. I hope it's visible. Yes, it is. The presentation. Yes. So thank you very much. And apologies that I didn't. Uh, I wasn't able to uh, attend the event from the beginning. But I'm I'm very happy to be here. And, and thanks for the invitation. So uh, some words about how lo local governments and cities and municipalities and the Baltic Marine Environment Protection Commission Helcom uh, can and have been uh, collaborating. First of all, uh, what is HELCOM? So we have a vision on a healthy Baltic Sea environment, which diverse, uh, in which uh, diverse biological components are functioning in balance, and this would result in a good ecological status and also support a wide range of sustainable uh, activities of, of the societies, both economic and social. This is quite a bold vision, I, I don't know. So uh, how HELCOM is striving for this vision 
Uh, as you might know, uh, we are a regional CS convention with 10 contracting parties that are visible on the map to the right. So nine uh, countries around the Baltic Sea and the EU. Helcom is a regional, of course, environmental policymaker. For, for example, we have the strategic program of measures, the Baltic Sea Action Plan, uh, adopted in 2007 and revised in uh, 21. Uh, we are also developing regional recommendations. They, the countries are committed to, uh, and also many guidelines related to different, both activities in the society and, for example, for monitoring the state of the sea. Helcom coordinates, uh, for example, some exercises for, for response uh, to, to accidents at sea. And then, uh, of course, uh, being the focal point for, for uh, monitoring and assessing the state of the sea, as I mentioned, that is a very uh, big effort. And actually, we are right this year having the third holistic assessment. Uh, we are publishing it in, in the autumn, and, and it starts with indicators and indicator reports. Then there are thematic reports. And uh, finally, the holistic assessment. Uh, Helcom also supervises, uh, for example, the regionally agreed nutrient reduction scheme. We have maximum allowable inputs and, and nutrient uh, input ceilings. And uh, that's also some achievement. I should mention that we have this kind of regional scheme. A very brief uh, history of Helcom. So it, it was uh, founded very early. So only two years after the UN Conference of the Human Environment, only uh, uh, two years after, so 1974. And the convention was revised in 1992 as uh, Originally, there were 70, uh, seven uh, contracting parties, but as I mentioned, now we have 10 contracting parties. And uh, the convention was ratified in 2000. The first Baltic Sea Action Plan, as I mentioned, 2007. And now we have a new one with almost 200 actions and measures, either joint or uh, national. And, and all of them have specific criteria of, of achievement and responsibilities under HELCOM, which group or, or subsidiary body are uh, uh, implementing or supporting the implementation of the different actions and so on. And the first holistic assessment was also published in 2007. And in the background, you can see the input of phosphorus uh, to the Baltic Sea, a waterborne part of that, that is uh, for phosphorus the most of it. And uh, since the peak in the beginning of 1980s, you can see that we have come a long way, but there's still work to do because we are still above uh, 22,000 tons in 2020, and it should be something uh, about 7,000. So there's still work to do, but we have already also achieved something. And I think, uh, yeah, actually, this is about the implementation I already mentioned. So it's uh, we have better chances than ever to actually aim for that vision I, I uh, presented in the beginning because uh, for this revised Baltic Sea Action Plan, all these uh, actions are much more uh, detailed, uh, defined, and, and then also there uh, is a joint effort to, to follow up on the implementation with Helcom Explorer and also in all of the expert groups and working groups that, it all, that is also done. And that was the last one. Yes, thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Lotta, for your presentation. And of course, for the cooperation we have had in the past, uh, which was very active, actually. And uh, good morning, everyone, of course, on my behalf. Um, uh, as uh, mentioned by Esther, um, Helcom is an um, extremely important um, partner for the UBC, and we have a long history of cooperation. Um, just to mention to our um, member cities that the UBC has an official um, observer status um, at the uh, HELCOM and this gives us or allows us to uh, basically contribute uh, to HELCOM's work and some of the very relevant processes and uh, also plan a joint activities or um, projects which we have had quite many um, actually in the past. But um, um, I would like to ask you Lotta also about uh, 
quite much about the action plan, which is really very important program of measures for you on national level, but also for us on local level. So successful implementation of this Baltic Sea Action Plan, as it was mentioned many times, de uh, demands the involvement of all relevant stakeholders and to get everyone on board, actually. Uh, how do you see the role of, of the cities in the implementation of the Baltic Sea Action Plan? Uh, could you um, elaborate a little bit from your experience? Thank you very much. So as, uh, as mentioned, UBC is one of the observer organizations. And, and I have to mention that observers are very important for the HELCOM community. We have over 60 regional uh, observers. And usually observers are kind of, uh, they, they are agile and front runners in many matters and, and propose matters to be also uh, implemented on regional policy level. And, and uh, so some of the actions and, and things that are uh, management objectives that are included in the Baltic Sea Action Plan actually originate from the local level. Uh, but then of course, uh, having a regional program to be implemented and, and the most uh, obvious uh, ones that are kind of responsible in implementing other countries, but both the regional level and, and the national level need the local level, especially municipalities, uh, depending of course on the mandate of, of cities and municipalities in different countries that are a bit variable. I know, but there are several actions, for example, in the eutrophication segment that are related to, to uh, implementation in cities, uh, also in the hazardous substances and marine litter segment, and also to some, uh, in, in some countries, cities also are hosting, for example, ports. So, so some very uh, important sea-based or maritime traffic related actions could be also uh, enhanced by, by actions uh, in cities and by, by cities. Uh, also, well, uh, maybe the, some, some clear examples would be related to uh, wastewater treatment and stormwater management. There are also the relevant HELCOM recommendations uh, that in practice will be implemented in uh, municipal water utilities and, and uh, municipalities uh, when they have the mandate to, to also ma uh, manage the stormwaters. But then in uh, some countries also, for example, cities and municipalities are a big landowners. They could be, uh, farming, having agricultural lands, and then the many actions uh, in the action plan that are related to, to uh, sustainable agricultural practices like, like uh, having buffer zones or improving soil structure or, or organic farming and so on, they could also be relevant for, for cities and, and uh, municipalities. And then, uh, well, related to hazardous substances, there are some actions that directly actually address uh, for example, small urban emitters of some, some hazardous substances or having uh, public procurement strategies that take into account hazardous substances management and so on. So it is very important and relevant to, to have cities and municipalities to implement actually many of the uh, relevant actions in the Baltic Sea Action Plan. Yes, uh, th thank you a lot. Uh, you actually answered also a little bit of, of um, another question I had, uh, because uh, the action Baltic Sea Action Plan has quite many um, uh, different actions to be fulfilled by 2030, like 199. Uh, and uh, the deadline, ultimate deadline is 2030, but pretty many um, um, targets should be achieved uh, much earlier before that. So um, actually my uh, question would be, what are the extremely important priority fields that you would like to focus or would need the urgent, um, um, I would say, um, actions from the local level and other levels? You mentioned hazardous substances, and I'm happy that we actually launched the new project uh, on the micropollutants and uh, emerging hazardous substances uh, funded by the Interact Baltic Sea Region program. You mentioned stormwaters as very important, but is there any um, um, 
in particular um, important field of actions which you would like us to step in. Um, for example, you have a spe specific hotspots list. Maybe we should bring attention of cities to this. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, as mentioned, there are already some some uh, in in some actions uh, they include reference kind of to the local level and and uh, and cities and urban areas. Uh, I, I forgot to mention earlier, but of course, general kind of uh, environmental education and awareness raising are also some some fields. There are several. Uh, actions related to that in, in all of the segments of, of uh, the main four segments of the Baltic Sea Action Plan, I believe, and, and also usually cities and municipalities have uh, wide experience and, and good practices on doing that as well. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, in the field of hazardous substances, it's usually it's, uh, there are very many kind of um, local level users and managers of, of different substances that could be also hazardous. And, and then it would be very important to find out how to maybe alleviate the, the uh, when, when they enter the environment. And if, for example, there's something to be, be done on the waste of the treatment or, or also stormwater management, as you mentioned. And uh, actually then some of these actions and, and uh, objectives are kind of intertwined. So for example, in, in uh, stormwater management or uh, wastewater treatment, both nutrients and hazardous substances, and also to some extent, uh, marine litter, micro litter, uh, especially, could be addressed. Uh, you mentioned hotspots, and there actually in the Baltic Sea Action Plan, there are specific actions uh, that relate to uh, defining criteria for designating new for hotspots. Uh, that might be in different fields. They they could be related to to nutrients, hazardous substances, but maybe also to marine litter and some other pressures. And actually, the work is uh, starting for that. We have this week uh, a consultation workshop to to start uh, with the experts, regional experts, uh, to to kind of consider what could be the criteria for new hotspots. But we still have the uh, so-called traditional old hotspots. So. Uh, the Joint Comprehensive Environmental Pro uh, Action Program in the beginning of 90s defined some uh, 160 hotspots, uh, of which 75% have been remediated, but still there are some, and some of these are uh, either industrial or municipal, and then they relate to specific locations and, and are relevant for, for uh, the, the local municipalities and cities. So maybe they could also be uh, as you mentioned, they are not only kind of national challenges, but they could be also tackled on the local level more. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will definitely follow the outcomes of the other group and uh, try to look into also the hotspots with our uh, member cities as um, one important thing to address. Um, uh, I would like also to ask you um, a little bit about the uh, concrete implementation and the guidelines on, on, on how to implement uh, the concrete measures as well. So very often uh, we do have also in the cities a very good um, action plan, but somehow it seems that the implementation lags sometimes behind. And do you think with the Baltic Sea Action Plan, we have been working actively on implementation of the measures, um, but as the latest assessment showed, we are still not yet. So we were ambitious, but but there is still much more work to be done to really um, achieve our um, goal with a healthy and resilient um, Baltic Sea. Um, how do you see the um, your health and recommendations? Do you have any tools also for cities, for local level, to to you know show the way um, how to do it? Like really, so the steps two and three, the first step with a vision, but then two and three implementation. Thank you. Well, that's uh, not only a local uh, level challenge, it's also a national and regional challenge, uh, the actual implementation. But I think there it helps to, to have, for example, have these uh, clearly defined criteria, what is, what is needed to uh, have something implemented. But of course, uh, some of these matters were also discussed uh, 
three weeks ago, 9th of March, there was a Baltic stakeholder conference where especially the local level implementation, but then also, uh, for example, financing and private sector involvement were, were uh, important uh, considerations. And I would say that also, I would expect that for, for uh, cities, uh, it's important if you can manage to, to somehow have these this, uh, public-private uh, partnerships for implementation of, of uh, strategies or action plans. And uh, it doesn't only mean like uh, bank, bankable projects, but it could be also NGOs that could be the, the private partner to be uh, collaborating with. And then, of course, uh, if there is a possibility to to have some uh, project funding, you mentioned earlier that the interact programs and so on, it's it's usually there are uh, good good kind of possibilities to have also that kind of uh, financing to implement something that would uh, otherwise not have resources to do it. But then, of course, uh, as such, UBC as a city and municipality network is an important uh, kind of facilitator because with networking, as, as you all know, it's possible to, to exchange experiences and, and learn practices from others even without any specific pro projects or, or extra funding. Sometimes it could be only uh, kind of changing a little bit of, of uh, how you do something that you every day in different uh, city departments or, or activities related to some quite uh, routine management in, in city administrations. So uh, maybe a kind of traditional financing and private pu uh, public partnerships, but then also a bit trying to uh, consider new ways. That if, if sometimes it could be also something smaller steps that actually could uh, you could reach something big with, with just something that seems to be small. Because from, uh, as you know, from uh, sm small streams, also the big rivers come. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Lotta. It was quite, uh, yes, uh, interesting and uh, informative to see how um, actually in very concrete means we could, uh, everyone uh, could add on to the clean and healthy Baltic Sea with their actions and a little bit of thinking outside the box, as we know exactly. The big changes come usually from uh, our small individual changes and um, also, of course, um, local and national level. Um, the successful implementation of the Baltic Sea uh, Action Plan, as you mentioned, um, uh, also depends on the availability of sufficient uh, funding, but not only. But do you think, this is my last question, do you think that we do have uh, uh, enough funding for implementing of uh, the actions to reach really ambitious goal of having the healthy Baltic Sea by 2030? I would say, in principle, there, there is funding enough. And as I mentioned, it could be uh, in in many cases, it's not uh, dependent on funding. If something, if, if some individual actions, for example, will be implemented either regionally or nationally, but uh, it's having the the important stakeholders like the local level on board, and actually that all the uh, involved uh, stakeholders understand uh, what is important in achieving that that. Uh, measure and how it's related as i mentioned uh also to to everyday work so to say but uh, also there is uh, there are international fund funding institutions there are these program uh, programs uh of eu funding and so on and there are also uh, usually on on the local level there are also uh, for example own financing programs for for uh regional I mean, kind of sub-regional or, or uh, local level projects available. And, and there are again, probably some, some partnerships with uh, either neighboring cities or some uh, companies or NGOs would be helpful. But in principle, also region-wide, I would say that there is definitely enough funding. We just have to find means to use the right funding for right actions. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Lotta. I think it was very optimistic at the end. Uh, unfortunately, we have to finish here. Um, it would be interesting to still um, discuss, but I will put the dot. And of course, it's really good to know as well that we have um, actually necessarily funding, but we need more of action and uh, make aware of all stakeholders on their concrete role and what kind of um, tasks they would take. So thank you so much for this. And I will, uh, I see we have questions also. So I will give a floor back to um, Esther for um, uh, taking the general discussion and also closing the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka. Actually, I would take one question up right now because it's especially to Lotta the question. And um, well, it's a topic that I guess many are interested in. Um, the question is about that Russia was on the map that you show, showed, and uh, the question is about if Russia is still a part of your operational area. Perhaps you could just shortly open up a little bit how that works in Helicom, because it's a bit different than in other organizations. Yes, thank you. So, uh, yes, Russia is, is still a contracting party to Helicom, and uh, uh, due to the political situation, uh, the, all the Helicom working groups and expert groups meetings have been postponed uh, for almost a year or a bit more than a year now. But uh, we are, uh, the, the contracting parties, the other the EU members and EU are, are hosting some informal consultations. And then we at the secretariat are in a position to be a neutral intermediate. So we also are communicating with, with the Russian uh, experts. And uh, so for example, if they're for uh, progressing the work, there could be some uh, uh, documents prepared or some proposals uh, prepared either by the Secretariat or, or some other contracting parties, and, and we can then uh, mediate those to, to the Russian counterparts. And actually, we have been able to progress the work of Helcom and also implementing of the Politics Action Plan quite well during the recent year, even though there's a very challenging situation. Okay, thank you a lot, Tafur. Uh, explaining that a little bit because I think that's uh, of course questions that always come and in general of course this would be a topic that we uh, could all elaborate on more and so on but uh, we would now actually like to um, yeah focus on the things that unite us and 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 focus on like to think about how we can develop uh, uh, the cooperation further. So first of all I would now like to say thank you to all of you um, three uh, speakers. I think we all got a lot of input. A lot of inputs, a lot of uh, hopefully a lot of uh, aha moments, perhaps uh, for those of you who were still wondering, like what are all these organizations about and what are they doing and how they relate to each other and so on. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think Dominic really like provided us with this really good allegory with, with the nest. So I, I really like that a lot. Um, and I think also the mentioning of how important it is to, how it, important it is actually to overlap in our activities and in our contacts and in our networks to kind of create this, this strong bond. I think that was really, really good. Um, yeah, like picture. Um, still, I would like to ask, uh, the three of you, the three speakers, and I will also take up one more question from the audience, but it fits together. Um, like, what is your vision? I mean, even though I, I, I have, I've realized myself, it's hard nowadays to have like really a lot of visions because we know that world can change. The world can change very uh, drastically in a, in a short amount of time. But what is your outlook or your vision on BSR cooperation for the next years or for the future? And how do you in your organizations plan to address address uh, changes or what, what would be the, the issues that you would wish for and, and what would be the steps you would your, your organizations are planning to take? Perhaps we start with Dominic as the... I'm the lucky one. <laughs> You yeah, were the last you. first one speaking. <laughs> so. thank, thank you, Esther. Well, I think there is definitely a kind of a wind of change in in the region and, and quite literally as well, because due to the current situation in Ukraine, a lot of things have happened uh, geopolitically, but also you know, testing the resilience of, of our societies and energies, for instance, uh, a, a topic that is now, you know, hotly hotly debated and hence the wind of change you now we are now moving towards 
you know, rolling out wind energy in the Baltic Sea region. And this is this is a very good, good example because it needs you know the, the collaboration of, of all stakeholders. It needs again, you know, it needs the local level, it needs the macro regional level, it needs the EU level. And this everything ties into you know the higher uh, UN level with the sustainable development goals on, on climate change. Mm. So there's a real opportunity in the region to do things and to move forward on issues where we were discussing a lot, where we had, as you said, we had lots of visions, but where the implementation part was a bit dragging. Mm -hmm. And I think this is now a very good moment to basically you know, start acting on, on, on what we have decided. And, and as, as sad as the situation is, yeah, this is not a situation that we would like to be in. On the other hand, it's also, you know, a catalyst of, of the implementation of actions that we have committed to. Hmm. Yes. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, Johanny, how do you see the outlook or what do you think as the now as a supporter, supporting structure of a EU strategy, so to say, like how, uh, how do you see the, 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 the outlook on, on how uh, the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region will develop and how, how it will uh, kind of influence on the cooperation in the region? Thank you, Esther, and, and uh, thank you, Dominic, also uh, for a very, very wise words there. I also uh, kind of agree that there is always opportunity in crisis. Mm. So now, now we really must take this opportunity to uh, be more, make, make the cooperation in the Baltic Sea region more agile, uh, advance on those sectors that we weren't able to uh, able to advance so rapidly, rapidly before. And I think this is a really a, a really a, a, an important time in the history of the region and in the history of the cooperation and the governance uh, governing organizations here to make the most of of themselves and become more agile, become more useful to the stakeholders, and uh, and uh, and develop and serve the thematic mm -hmm. developments in the various various mm -hmm. fields. Yes, thank you, thank you, Johanny. I think agile, agile uh, organizations, or like the how we react on on crises and how we kind of adapt uh, as organizations. That's really something we had to learn uh, in the past years on different crises, uh, but something very useful. And I think also perhaps for many years this was not necessary. So also organizations tend to become a bit static. So uh, sometimes, yeah, as you said, sometimes crises can be. In a way, bring out something positive that you actually are forced to forced to change. Lotta, do you have um, still a comment on the outlook of? You have a bold vision, but I think that's how visions have to be. Yes, it's uh, it's yeah. vision by twenty thirty. Well, when the Baltic Sea Action Plan should be implemented by, and let's see how it goes. Anyway, we are uh, aiming for for having big strides towards that. But I, I would like to mention also the. Uh, in, uh, Kind of cooperation between regional organizations. So, for example, uh, the Baltic Sea Action Plan and the Action Plan of the uh, EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region, they are quite intertwined. And now we have better than ever possibilities kind of to, to actually, as mentioned by Dominique and Johanny already, to, to implement more with the, uh, more uh, with maybe new perspectives, having these this very uh, specific circumstances at hand. And it was mentioned in the chat or in the questions uh, that WhatsApp is also a regional organization. And, and I just want to, uh, to mention that Helcom and WhatsApp are actually collaborating very concretely and closely related to maritime spatial planning. And maritime sp spatial planning is also related to, to for example, this uh, offshore wind energy boost that we are now having. And, and uh, also, of course, the Helcom point of view is not only to uh, mitigate uh, climate change, but also to take into consideration how the marine environment uh, is affected and, and actually where to have these wind parks so that the uh, fragile marine environment in the Baltic Sea is not affected too much and, and also to be able to, to adapt and so on. But mm -hmm. uh, it was mentioned al already by Johanny and Dominic that, that, of course, we are having very uh, challenging but specific times and there are a lot of opportunities to that as well. So I hope we can use them. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Lotta. 
Now I would just like to take up a comment or like a question that came came from the audience, and I think it's a it's a good uh, thing to also like kind of wrap up our discussion because uh, it was really good. I think it was really good that we kind of organized this and clarified to the audience or to the cities also how how the city's voices can be heard in, in, in your organizations, how we as a city network can contribute and vice versa and so on. So um, the question is like, do the speak, do speakers assume that it would be a good, that, that it would be of a great benefit to present the opportunities for cooperation for local authorities regularly, and that it would help to understand the roles and focuses of different organizations within the region. This is perhaps a little bit like aiming at like, how do we, um, or how do you, um, communicate those opportunities that we now uh, kind of mapped out in this in this webinar how could we and that's for all of us to think perhaps how could we um, make sure that this information about the possibilities to participate also reach the cities um, any comments from you or ideas if i may well i would uh, suppose that the ubc will be an important pathway from for example helcom to mm -hmm. to the cities because uh, you are an observer and you have access to many of the the working groups and expert groups and materials and then uh, also to uh we hope that that ubc will be the the and sustainable cities commission especially will be active in also bringing some uh, proposals and and for example challenges where the, the cities or municipalities have not been heard or, or where mm. there could be some some challenge, uh, solutions that we actually are not aware of. So just even more collaboration. Yeah. I, I think that's the key. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. And before I comment from our side, just do you, Dominic or Johanny, have some comment on that? I mean, I, I can only echo what, what Lotta just said. Uh, more cooperation is what's needed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back to the image of the nest. I mean, you know, we need to know where we are. We need to know where each twig is to be able mm -hmm. to, you know, form <laughs> form the whole. So the more we talk, the more we mm. exchange, um, you know, the more common of an idea we will have on where the journey is actually taking us and, you know, what, you know, the underlying issues are, what the strategies are and so forth. So yeah. I can only, you know, embrace and I can only recommend that, you know, these kind of formats like the UBC talks mm. uh, do actually, you know, take place on a more, um, you know, regular basis when mm. it comes to UBC. But, you know, we have a lot of, you know, discussion formats already going on. Um, for instance, USPs, our annual forum and so forth, um, Helcom stakeholder conference. And, but we need more of these. Yeah. And it's, mm -hmm. it's really important that we maintain and stay in constant dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Yeah, perhaps on a concrete uh, level, I would just say that, yeah, I, I can also see, of course, an important role of our network and of us reaching out to the member cities or to other cities in, in the Baltic Sea region. But I would like to encourage also you as uh, um, other Baltic Sea region organizations and perhaps also those that are in the audience that uh, we are, of course, also really um, open and willingly to share information. So if there are opportunities for cities, if it is concerning funding, if it is concerning taking part in events, if it is whatever, taking part in some projects or what it can be, um, you can get in touch with us and we can also spread the word because then we have the contacts perhaps to 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 those uh, to local authorities or specific uh, experts and local authorities. So, so um, we would also invite you to then get in touch with us and kind of let us know if you have opportunities for cities or for local authorities to to participate and to contribute. Then we are we are um, yeah happy to be that connection point, let's say between between the cities and you, um, Johanny. You also already invited uh, cities to knock at your door, so I think uh, or like call you. So I think uh, you you mentioned that that's a really good opportunity, of course, as well. Um, did you want to say something still or? I, nothing to add here. No. Communication, okay. communication, communication. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that, that that is true. Of course, we have to make sure that it's somehow targeted, that it's not too much, because I can also imagine like it's it's also it's very easily to be overwhelmed by too much, too much information. But um, to all the cities uh, out there, I mean, as you we, we try to um, Try to be the filters, and I think now you you have the opportunity to have good entry points into this topic of the cooperation in this region. 
So um, I would like to wrap up the discussion uh, here. And thank you very much um, to all the speakers one more time. Um, as a last info, I would like to draw your attention to yeah the final, final slide. Um, here we have actually collected something now we didn't have time or that was not our or the main intention to very go deeply into funding opportunities but as we have mentioned this many 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 times now um, we are of course really uh, happy that there are several uh, options several opportunities to get funding for cooperation projects for events for like doing facilitating this cooperation from a financial perspective so here we have a, a list of of um, of the available programs many of them very targeting uh, local authorities so there is a lot of support uh, financial support also available and if you have any questions or also um, are interested in developing something together you're really welcome to get in touch with us um, of the upcoming event list that we see here i would just really like to uh, you can re read it there and and of course you find all the info also on our website but i would uh, also uh, say another uh, a second time um, would encourage you to to uh, come to the eu sbsr annual forum in riga if you're really interested in this topic there you will meet all of us and uh, I think that could be a really good opportunity also for cities to come and uh, be part of the discussion, take part in the different workshops and really uh, use this networking opportunity. It's the one event per year, I think, but that is very, very useful if you are um, interested in the Baltic Sea region cooperation. And otherwise, um, yeah, if there are any questions uh, concerning the, these webinars, concerning anything related we have discussed here, please get in touch with us. We are really uh, thankful that you joined us for today. We will also uh, have uh, an, another uh, or other UBC talks webinars coming up. If you're interested, please follow our social media or check our website, sign up for our newsletters, then you will get notification when we have the next events um, planned. And you will find the recording and all the information, the, uh, the presentations and so on, on our website after this event. So thank you all one more time and um, well, hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye.